Johnny Tremaine, A Story of Boston in Revolt by Esther Forbes, Chapter 4, Part 3. Standing on Beacon Hill, so far removed from the hurly-burly of, of the wharves, shops, markets of town, Johnny hesitated. Should he, as a poor, out-of-work apprentice, go around back, or should he, as a long-lost something or other, raise that gleaming brass knocker on the paneled front door? The silver buttons and Rab's bold fellow hardened him, hardened him hardened him. The silver buttons and Rab's bold fellow hardened him. The door, the knocker fell, and instantly a maid was bidding him enter, Curtis curtsying, asking his name. I'm Jonathan Light Tremaine. The front hall was very large. From, its ro from it rose, from it rose a flight of stairs, taking their time and their rising, taking all the space they needed. Along the walls were portraits, Merchant Light in his handsome, healthy youth, Lavinia, painted long before in London, as regal as a child as now she was a young woman. Time blackened old things, already a hundred years old. Was it their long, dried blood, which now red and ran red and living in Johnny's veins? To the left was the drawing room, the tinkle of a spinet, low voices, laughter, could it be they were laughing because the maid was announcing him? He wished he could call himself merely Johnny Tremaine. Ha, ha, ha. That was Merchant Light. Fetch him in, Jenny. Just a little family party. All want to see him, eh? <laughs> Johnny's first impression was of dozens of wax candles. Lighting was of dozens of wax candles lighting the long dove colored and lavender and yellow room. They were reflected in mirrors, silver, gleaming floors, and mahogany. A dozen people were gathered together in the far east end of the room. The far end of the room. Johnny stood a moment, anxious to do nothing wrong, conscious that the new shoes he had been so proud of did not much resemble the little black buckled pumps on the gentleman. Well, said Mr. Light, rising but not approaching him. So, here we are. Yes, sir. Lavinia, Cousin Talbot, Aunt Best, how do you like his looks? Aunt Best, a horrible, a horror, a horrifying, ugly, cross old woman with two gold-headed canes vowed through her whiskers and toothless gums that he looked just as bad as she had expected. Lavinia turned from the snippet. She had, she had on a stiff turquoise blue dress that suited her marvelously. She looked at the boy with her head tipped sideways as Johnny had seen other ladies look at silver teapots before they bought. At least, Papa, he's a deal handsomer than most of my relatives. Isn't he, isn't he, Cousin Sewell? It was the rosy clerk, lovelorn Sewell, who was turning her music for her. Yes, dear, Mr. Light's eyes flickered over Johnny, quite the little gentleman, from the waist up. Silver buttons, eh? Ruffled shirt? <laughs> his eyes slid over his little family party. He addressed them in so low a voice, he seemed to ignore Johnny standing at the far upper end of the long room. He had been expecting such, some such apparition from the past ever since last August. In spite of family efforts to keep certain things dark, he had reason to believe certain things were well known, even among the uh, lower class. Then he called to Johnny. Now, boy, you brought your cup? It is here, in this bag. Very good. Will you, and all of you, please, step into the dining room? This took some time, for Aunt Best had to be pulled in front and pushed from behind before she was balanced on her two gold-headed canes. She scolded, muttered, 
and shook her whiskers at what at everyone, including her famous nephew. Only Lavinia, still at the spinet, the cousin Sewell bending over her, did not go into the dining room. There on the sidebar were three standing cups. They were identical to Johnny's. Silently, he took his from its bag and set it with the other three, then stood back to look at the silken, bejeweled, perfumed folk crowding about him. Mr. Light took up the cup, studied it, compared it with the ones of his own. Silently, he handed it to a plainly dressed, thick-set gentleman who thus far had said nothing. I think, said Mr. Light quietly, all of you ladies and gentlemen will agree that this cup, our uh, cousin, as it is it, has brought back tonight, is one of the set. There was a murmur of assent. Johnny could hear the tiny, tinkling, seemingly far away of Miss Lavinia's spinet. It was perfectly obvious that this cup now stands where it belongs. The question is, how was it ever separated from its fellows? Johnny felt that everyone there except himself knew the answer to this question. In fact, the merchant's voice was smooth as oil. I declare this to be the very cup which was stolen from me by thieves. They broke through yonder window on the 23rd of last August. Sheriff, I ordered you, I order you arrest this boy for burglary. The thick-set plain man whom Johnny had already noticed put a heavy hand on his shoulder. His formal, formal words flowed over him. Johnny Tremaine, alias Johnny Light Tremaine, apprenticed to Ephraim Lefem, Lefem, name of King and Bay Colony, standing cup, taken over 23rd day, month, year of our Lord 1,773. This is not true, Johnny said. You can explain to the judge. Very well, I can and I will. The full horror of the accusation for a boy might be hanged for stealing a cup froze him into seeming, un, seeming nonchalance. This coolness made a bad impression. Aunt Best was poking at him with one of her canes. She hoped she'd live long enough to see him hanged. He was a perfect little viper, and he looked it. A florid woman was flapping a pink feather fan. She thought he had one of those falsely <coughs> innocent little faces that are such an ad, such an aid to evil boys. No, someone else was saying. He has shifty eyes. Aunt Best crooked. Look at those silver buttons on his coat. I'm sure he stole them. Mr. Light said, Boy, where did you get this coat? It was lent to me. Lent you? By whom, pray? A printer boy. A printer's boy. I don't know his name. Down at Observer Office. He's called Rab. That coat is worth money. Do you think someone whose last name you admit you don't know would lend you a coat? It doesn't that sound like it, but happens it's true. Sheriff, look at this. I certainly will, Mr. Light. I sent Sewell over to the Lathams, a very respectable, humble, pious, poor sort of folk. Mrs. Latham swore this boy never owned a thing but the clothes he stood in. As for his name, he showed Sewell the papers of his indenture signed by his dead mother. She put him down as Johnny Tremaine. No Johnny Light about it. And Mrs. Latham believed that lately he had taken an evil, taken to evil ways, stealing shoes and little things. She swore he never owned a cup. And Mr. Tweedy, a partner of Latham, said the boy was a notorious liar and of most evil report. The sheriff was taking off handcuffs, <clears throat> snapping them on Johnny's wrist and his own. Soon's I get the scamp looked up, locked up. Soon's I get the scamp locked up, I'll be back for that bowl of punch you promised, Mr. Light. He called cheerfully as he left. 
The last sound Johnny heard was the fairy tinkle of the spinet. The chain clanked. The sheriff said nothing until he had reached the stone jail in prison lane. Then as the jailer was writing down Johnny's name in his book, the sheriff said kindly, Now, boy, you've got some rights. Who do you want notified? Got any kin except the lights, eh? How about old Mr. Latham? He's my master no more. He dismissed me months ago. Relatives? Parents? I've nothing. But you, but will you please tell that boy down at the observer? He's the tall and dark. He's a tall and dark. All I know is that his name is Rab. The one you stole the coat off, huh? I was going to look him up tonight. The end of chapter four, part three.